la mokoye na wa Code of the Lamb was one of my favourite games released in 2022. It combines farming with dungeon crawling mechanics requiring you to balance going out and adventuring as well as taking care of your cult. Given the fact that there is so much story within the game, I thought a long time ago about doing a lore video, which was eventually scrapped. That is, until I saw a new update was announced for the game. In this video, I will be covering the entire lore of Code of the Lamb, as well as all lore featured in the Relics of the Old Faith content update. The game starts off with an opening dialogue warning us that a crown cannot sit upon two brows. As the game fades in, we play as a lamb bound in rope, about to be taken to our execution. Four bishops stand in front of us, and they talk about us being the last of our kind. The bishops you see have decided to kill every lamb they can find, to prevent a prophecy from being fulfilled. This prophecy suggests that a lamb will free a so-called heretic, thus destroying the old faith. We are then killed and sent to the afterlife, where we are introduced to the one who waits, the so-called heretic the other bishops were talking about. Now, the lamb is most commonly used as a sacrifice in rituals, and is essential for the one who waits to break free from his prison. He asks us to start a cult in his name, to which we have no choice but to accept, and are given the power of the Red Crown. Breaking free, we defeat the enemies and are introduced to Ratu. Ratau? How do I say that? Hang on to Ratau, a former vessel of the Red Crown. Given the paper crown he wears on his head, he still hasn't forgotten his attachment to his previous role. Claiming to have been sent by someone to help us, we continue forward. Interrupting a sacrificial ritual, we then save our first cult member. Using the power of the Red Crown, we are then taken to an abandoned temple lost to time. Our cult doesn't look great at the moment, but with the help of Ratau, we manage to get some of the basics down pretty quickly. Quickly. Using our first follower, we then reach the first realm of the game, Darkwood. Here we are worn through a tombstone about not following the old faith, and moving on we meet with Clawneck, who tells us the prophecy the bishops were trying to stop. His role involves drawing us cards in accordance to our fate, and he helps us through the use of the card's powers. At the end of every level, a loyal follower from a bishop will attempt to stop us, resulting in them transforming into monsters who we can destroy and convert into our cult. Now that we have built our cult, we have to maintain it by performing sermons, following quests, cleaning up, cooking food, and generally ensuring that our followers remain satisfied. I should also mention that the first bishop of Darkwood, Leshy, is based upon a Slavic myth by a creature of the same name. This creature likes playing tricks on people and kidnapping kids. Just thought that was interesting. Ratau gives us the ability to summon curses. We also get confirmation that he can still communicate with the one who waits. We find a creature by the name of Harrow, who throughout the game provides us with very valuable and interesting lore. Harrow explains how the land used to be filled with hundreds of gods who, through war, ended up killing each other off. The gods that remain ended up creating their own following, explaining why the bishops hold so much power. It's unclear what Harrow's role was during this time. We then declare our first doctrine, and can now perform the bonfire ritual. Doctrines allow us to choose between two benefits which will help our cult grow stronger. Later we encounter the three bishops Leshy, Hecate, and Kalama, who are surprised at us still being alive. They agree not to bother Shamura, the spider creature we previously saw. Also notice how each of these figures have bandages on them. After beating the area, we are then taken to the one who waits, who gives us the ability to read minds. We can now visit Ratau in the Lonely Shack. Going inside, Ratau warns us not to make the same mistakes he did, or we could end up living in a place like this. He invites us to a game of knuckle bones, and we can continue on our way to kill Leshy. Upon encountering the final area, Leshy makes his followers sacrifice themselves to make himself stronger. We 
We kill Leshy after an intense battle and take his heart, which we can use in exchange for one of four powers. In a side area, we can also make our way to Pilgrim's Passage, where a fisherman who claims to not be a fish teaches us how to fish. We meet the lighthouse keeper who complains about the lighthouse becoming so dim that ships keep crashing. The leader would normally know what to do, although she disappeared after going for a walk at night, even after being warned of the teeth in the darkness. Anyway, we can restore the light and as a reward we will be given devotion from the lighthouse keeper and all other followers. Breaking one of the chains belonging to Leshy, we can now make our way towards Anura. Now, the actual interpretation of Heket in Egyptian mythology is usually represented as a frog goddess associated with fertility. The Heket we see in the game is associated with famine and will occasionally starve your followers as punishment for going against the old faith. After finishing the first segment, we are given the ability to sacrifice our cult members in order to make ourselves stronger. When the three bishops face us again, Shimura speaks near nonsense to despite being asked for advice from the others. Hecat apologizes to them and decides to move on with the conversation, asking us to bow to them. If we refuse, Hecat will turn all further resource areas into dungeon areas. We meet up with Kudai, the brother of Klawneck, who will give us weapons he forged. Later on, we gain the ability to turn offerings into gold. Now, an important character in the game is Kemak, who is a new addition to the Relics of the Old Faith update. She she claims that Klawneck and Kudai are her brothers, and that she herself is responsible for creating relics made out of fallen gods. Her design is very interesting as well, because unlike the other bishops, she does not have a single bandage on her, despite clearly having a crown. She's also trapped by chains, and her crown appears to be very different. Perhaps her being confined was an action from the bishops, or maybe she did it to herself since her appearance is far too large to move around freely, and if the crown is not as powerful when compared to the other bishops, she might not be able to make herself float. Given her size, she would actually need the chains to hoist her up, so I'm going to go with the latter idea. Upon meeting Hecate again, she claims that the red crown was cast out a mere thousand or so years ago. So does this mean that the crowns have a mind of their own? Perhaps they influence the behaviours of those who wear it, given that Hecate talks about the crown's ability to preach ideas. If we go to Kudai after the encounter with Kamak, he gives us a backstory. Kudai, Klawneck, and Kamak were born from the last of the first gods after all other gods were slain. They were responsible for crafting weapons for the gods. He then gives us a hint as to where the next relic is. If we speak to Klawneck, he claims that Kamak's insanity had always been foreseen by the cards he drew. We fight Hecate, who using the power of her followers turns into this. We kill her, steal her heart, and are then encouraged by the one who waits to continue. Afterwards, we can go to Spore Grotto, a place inhabited by fungi. We meet a creature named Sozo who appears to be controlled by a fungi parasite. If we go out of the map, we can see the same parasite on the top of a very large creature where Spore Grotto is, perhaps being one of the gods who were killed many years ago. Sozo appears to have his own followers, but he doesn't trust them very much and tasks us with collecting mushrooms. Moving on to Anchor Deep, we encounter Kalamar, who intimidates us by bringing disease onto our followers. We learn through a later encounter that aside from Matau, there are many others who wore the Red Crown. Kalamar is a bit of a coward, claiming that it was not his idea to cast out the Red Crown, but rather his siblings. He even asks that you kill Shimura and not him, as he fears having to face the one who waits. Now, I should mention a side character named Ratu, meeting 
up with him will allow you to collect as many hearts as you want. Although it should be noted that Ratu is constantly seeking out his own heart, which was stolen by a lover. He has searched for his heart for many years and has never been able to find them or his heart. He can't even remember what his lover looks like. We encounter Shimura who has a tendency to speak in riddles. They inform us how Kalamar was always afraid of the Red Crown, and after defeating several enemies we move forward. Fornius is another interesting side character with an equally tragic backstory as Ratu. She claims how her two children were given as a gift to the one who waits. Anyways, we break her shit and continue forward. Kalamar's attacks are the most diverse, given that he is the most afraid of death. He uses four weapons, each with various uses to get rid of you. Before going on to the next area, we can help fix the lighthouse using the crystals from Anchor Deep. Smuggler's Sanctuary is another area we unlock, where we can speak to a guy called Plimber. He claims that us killing the bishops have caused monstrous beasts to enter the waterways. He informs us that when a bishop dies, a creature called a Witness takes its place. He asks us for the eyes of each of the witnesses before we continue on. As to why the witnesses are so important, we don't know yet, but we might find out later if we return with the eyes needed to complete the side quests. It's here in the final area that we can speak to Harrow once again. Harrow explains how each of the bishops had something taken away from them. A pretty gruesome fate which may explain why they have such a strong grudge towards the one who waits. Each of these bishops correlate in some form to the phrase see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil, think no evil, and do no evil. This sort of gives us an understanding as to why Shimura can only speak in riddles since they had their skull split. It's also why all the other bishops are hesitant to call on Shimura for help. I think that aside from Shimura who had the mind taken and the one who waits who had his freedom taken, the three other bishops are much more metaphorical. Since Leshi is careless, he can't really see the consequences of his actions. He is blind. Hecate now only speaks through anger and insults and quite possibly lost her influence, aka her voice. And Kalamar was the only one who refused to listen to the prophecy and also refused his fate the most when the lamb started killing all the other bishops. Perhaps these conclusions are a little far-fetched, but you can certainly put your own thoughts in the comments as to what the injury symbolize. Through a poem or riddle given by Shimura, we then find out that the one who waits is named Narinda, and is most likely the embodiment of death. Narinda began questioning his role and betrayed the other four bishops in his quest for change. Shimura gives us a taste of this betrayal by turning our own cult members against us. After beating the area, we find a sign pointing us to Midas's cave. In another encounter with Shimura, we are then told that they are the ones who introduced Narinda to change, with Shimura's ever-evolving knowledge causing Narinda to betray the four bishops. Shimura states that death cannot flow backwards. What I think might have happened is that Narinda wanted to change his role as death. He didn't want to be the god who killed people, he also wanted to be the god who could bring them back. It also explains why he was able to resurrect the lamb so easily. Shimura asked after finding out that Narinda had betrayed his role, probably helped bring about his imprisonment. In the achievements as well, we actually get the opposite of what each of the four bishops represent, if we beat each of them without taking damage. Leshi is based on order, the opposite of chaos. Hecate is based on sate, the opposite of hunger. Kalamar is based on cure, the opposite of illness. And Shimura is based on peace, the opposite of war. Whilst Narinda is the only one without an opposite state, his role as death is forever unchanging, so we have at least some understanding as to why he would want to rebel. Not much happens until we are taken to this area, where an unnamed figure talks to us 
It claims that we are causing damage to this world by killing all other gods. It's also implied that we ourselves may become a god by the end of the game. Through another encounter with one of the Knucklebones players, Shroomy, it's implied that Ratao probably wasn't capable of using the Red Crown to its full power since he wanted to stay true to who he was and didn't let the crown corrupt him. We beat Shimura, who at this point has already accepted their fate, and we are then taken to Narinda. Narinda congratulates us on our efforts and states that the Red Crown is his. All we have to do now is return it to him. When we have 20 followers, we are then able to enter the final realm. The lamb being needed as the last sacrifice to fulfill the prophecy is a bit problematic. Given the choice, we can actually refuse to be sacrificed, resulting in the final boss of the game starting. We make quick work out of Bao and Aim, his devout followers. Through sheer anger at our betrayal, Narinda frees himself and fights us. After falling down from the afterlife, we are then shown his true form and fight him to the death. Narinda then returns to a much smaller form where we can either choose to kill or spare him. At the end of the game, we are confronted by the unnamed figure who refers to us as a god. The figure states that we have caused each of the bishops to be stuck in an endless loop of pain in the final moments of death. I also forgot to mention this statue, which tells us that the area we're in is where the gods fought. Now, in the post game, we will need to replay each of the segments in order to ensure that all bishops become free. We find Midas as a new encounter who will steal some of our gold whenever we cross paths. Boss fights appear to be resurrected versions of their previous counterparts, and are slightly more difficult to defeat. Killing them, however, will grant us a god tier which we can use from the mysterious figure to attain rewards. The tiers, according to the figure, are only seen by those who have ascended to godhood, and can only be created by the worst of villains. We also get to name the figure, who I will now be referring to as the Great Eye. After this interaction, we can give the god tier to the Great Eye and get some interesting rewards, two of which are essential for one of the side missions. More on that later. Each statue of the bishop whose realm you're in will also say something different. Once we get to Leshi, he is clearly not in the best state. We can actually see his mouth and or his empty eye socket appearing from behind the blindfold. After defeating him, we can get him as a follower. The Great Eye opens up purgatory for us 
us to enter once a day, which upon beating will grant us a god tier. We also get some dialogue about Leshy. Since he is referred to as the youngest of the bishops, he was the last to bargain with the Great Eye. Many were also drawn to his chaotic ways. Leshy, upon entering our cult, asked for his eye back, which is lost in Darkwood. Collecting Leshy's eye, we get a relic that, upon making contact with an enemy, will continuously damage them. If we return to Leshy, he will ask us to hold on to it. In regards to some of the side areas, we find what I assume to actually be Ratu's lover. Fighting Hecate again, we see her throat is a bit damaged, although compared to the other three bishops, she has the least amount of damage done to her. After defeating her, she asks for food, which I find interesting given that she is a bishop of famine. Whilst talking to Hecate, I also found that you could unlock extra dialogue by giving each bishop an item from the realm. From Hecate, we only get aggression, but from Leshy, we find out that when he was a worm, burrowing through the ground, he happened to find a crown that gave him power powers. Using this logic, a bishop isn't necessarily built over time through some trait, but rather they attain their abilities through whatever powers the crown gives them. Hecate also asks for her throat back from Anira. I also like that Hecate takes a long time to talk to compared to her bishop form. Perhaps the crown gave her the ability to speak more freely even without her throat. Hecate's throat will increase our attack damage for 10 seconds. Kalamur's statue, unlike the other bishops, is much more desperate, reflecting his cowardly behaviour. Upon approaching him, he begs for us not to hurt him. Half of his face is also destroyed. Now that I think about it, since all other bishops have to continue reliving the pain of being killed by the Red Crown, the bodies have probably taken a toll. This may explain why there is extensive scarring and damage done to them. Kalamar, upon entering the cult, feels sick, a reflection of his power to spread illness. One of his traits, interestingly enough, is a fear of death, which I thought was a pretty cool detail. Upon giving Kalamar a crystal from Anchor Deep, he talks about how his temple was the most beautiful, and Hecate's was the most ugliest. Going to the Great Eye, we are told that although Kalamar had ears, he was not inclined to listen, although he wielded the power of his crown without discrimination. Using Kalamar's ear, we can summon an undead follower to help us. Before we continue, let's try going to Midas's cave. Everyone watching this probably knows about the myth in which Midas's touch turns everything to gold. In this interpretation of Midas, he turns creatures to gold using rituals. He acts very suspicious throughout our encounters with him. When he talks about a well which has the ability to increase your fortune if you throw money into it, the statues begin to laugh. Another station involves you paying gold to get more devotion. We can also sacrifice members of our cult to get talisman pieces needed for cloaks. Shimura refers to us as the new god of of death, which I find quite eerie. Midas will also steal our gold for the fourth time, so we can kindly opt to beat the shit out of him and get the achievement shakedown. His face will appear damaged for the remainder of the game. Shimura also seems to be very torn up, with the lower stomach being cut open and most of the face having been ripped off. Upon indoctrinating them into your cult, they will immediately descend. The Great Eye will comment that Shimura did not need to barter much compared compared to the other bishops, quite possibly because of their intelligence. The Great Eye states that we ourselves have become a god, although compared to other gods, the Great Eye has seen our form to be the least capable of wielding so much power. The statue he gives us is of the one who waits, to remind us of the role we must fill, effectively making the Lamb the new god of death. Anyways, some additional information, my recorded file got corrupted at this point. Thank you, OBS. Sonzo ends up dying from a mushroom overdose and Plimbo explains to us that the Witnesses have been around for many thousands of years, as witnesses to the gods who lived long ago. Shimura asks for their skull back, but the mind is already so destroyed they are unable to recognize it. To end on a positive note, there are three additional side quests we can finish for a full completion of the game. We are given two important necklaces in the game by the Great Eye. Giving these to one of our followers and then sacrificing them, we can summon both Bar and Aim, the followers we see in the final boss segment of the game. We can then transform them into demons to take along with us. Fornius will have different dialogue for both of them. Mark a 
นอตรัสพอลปากมิวคัดมาคาพาฮาสพาลาอัตพาลาปากมิวคาสัตรูรัปรอนอตรัสพอลาคาสปากมิวคาสัตรูรัปรอมาคาพาฮาสพาลาอาดนอตรัสพอลาคาสัตพอลาฮัตพอลาปากมิวคาสัตรูนอตรัสพอลาคาสัตพอลามาคาพาฮาสพาลาอาดในทางThe shack sits empty as we see only Ratao's friends waiting inside, oblivious as to what happened to him. <laughs> 